You're listening to Conferences on Line Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 11, 2017, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Regaining Asthma Control, the Yellow Zone. Our presenter is Dr. Chitra Dinakar. She's a clinical professor in the Division of Allergy and Asthma at Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. much for that very kind introduction and glad to meet the new fellows. So sorry I couldn't be there to see you guys in person, but welcome. You'll, uh, I'm sure you love the program and uh, it's certainly really, really awesome. Uh, with that, I'm just going to... Uh -oh. All right, these are my conflicts. Um, let me just get this screen out of here. Sorry, I'm just trying to minimize this other thing that I'm seeing here. Okay, these are my conflicts, uh, and uh, I will be discussing unapproved um, investigative use um, of, the, of some products, and I'll let you know which one. So the point of this uh, talk today is to uh, discuss what is a yellow zone, uh, when does a patient recognize when they're losing control, and this is something we want them to know at a home setting. So we're not going to talk about in the doctor's office or in the ER or in urgent care or what you do when the, you see the patient. This is really about what the patient and family does at home. And I'll discuss some of the strategies that can be recommended uh, based on the evidence. So we are all familiar, and I know Children's Mercy knows the NIH guidelines, uh, like the back of their hand. So the EPR3 document is uh, what we use as a framework for understanding how to manage asthma. As you know, the document is fantastic in that it, uh, for the first time, outlined new concepts of control and responsiveness. In the past, we used to manage asthma by assessing the severity, which is uh, really how uh, intense the diseases and then we would start treatment. But after the new guidelines came out, and I say new, it's not new anymore, it's been many years, we started changing our focus to control, which is after you start treatment, how well is the patient doing? And that made a lot of sense when you consider asthma to be a chronic disease, just like diabetes and other conditions. It's not just the start of the treatment that's important, but what patients do after you start and how well do they respond to the treatment you're starting and how do you adjust it as they go along, uh, what fine tuning do you need to do. That was really, really well laid out in the um, uh, uh, EPR3 guidelines. And as you are, can see from this table that I know you're very familiar with, we classified the components of control as impairment and risk. Uh, impairment is really what the patient experiences and risk is the future. Uh, what is their lung function going to be or what above all do no harm kind of concept. And then we divide them as well controlled, not well controlled and fully controlled. And if you look at, if you recall your initial assessment parameters of severity, they're very similar. So it's really trying to titrate the patient um, during the course of their um, uh, asthma to make sure that they are always in a happy balance between doing well with their asthma and not having too much harm from the medications. You're also familiar with the steps of the asthma plan. Um, and um, if you recall, the guidelines were uh, made uh, a little few years ago. And I will also uh, show you the GINA guidelines, the Global Initiative of Asthma Guidelines, which are updated on a more frequent basis. And just to tell you the trend uh, of thinking about asthma management uh, that is going more in uh, favor of control aggressively early and often uh, kind of concept. Uh, you're familiar with these step-up approaches of the guidelines. So let me now show you the GINA 2017. Uh, it may not show up very well on your screen. Please feel free to uh, go to the actual sites. I downloaded these uh, slides from uh, the GINA guidelines. They have a set of teaching slides which are fantastic. Um, and this is uh, what I wanted to show you. So. As you can see, they have updated it, and they have step one to step five, um, and they have added SLIT as an option there. But what you will see as you go through the GINA guidelines is a focus on 
inhaled steroids, uh, starting it early, even in step one. If you'll notice the uh, preferred control of choice with step one, which we are used to thinking of intermittent asthmatics, they have said consider low-dose ICS. And this is based on current understanding that patients often uh, underestimate their asthma and uh, dismiss symptoms um, as being uh, random and not really related to underlying uh, inflammation. And so it's very interesting that their focus is shifting to early and aggressive use of inhaled steroids. And that really is the concept of the practice parameter and the yellow zone management uh, that we need to recognize very early uh, alterations in asthma control and help patients uh, have strategies that will get them back to their baseline control. So you're familiar with the asthma action plan uh, with the green, yellow, and red zone based on the traffic lights. Green zone is everything is good, keep going. Um, yellow is, um, the red is of course stop, uh, things are uh, bad, you need to do something uh, aggressive. And the yellow is very interesting when I've asked my uh, uh, patients what do you think yellow zone means, uh, some of them say yellow means accelerate treatment, uh, like when they're at a signal, the others, you know, press their foot on the brake and try to shoot through the red, as uh, through the yellow, uh, trying to beat the red, and that's a part of step up treatment or slow down and um, monitor your symptoms and make sure you're getting back to baseline. So you can take the yellow either which way when you talk about it to your patients, depending on whether they're the type who will slow down when they see the yellow light at a signal or they will try to beat the red. Uh, a very, very important study done way back in 2004 was the GOLD study, and this was done around the time uh, when everyone was focusing on the concept of control and can we really achieve good control in our asthma patients if we follow the guidelines, if we did everything that we were supposed to and patients did everything they were supposed to. So that was called the Gaining Optimal Asthma Control and it's a very beautiful, elegant study that I highly recommend you look at. It's one of the landmark papers that you need to be aware of. So this is a paper where they try to look at the guidelines both the GINA and the NIH and try to have patients gain co uh, complete control. Interestingly, despite it being a research study, despite the total focus of the study being asthma control, only 41% of patients gained control uh, and well control was 71% of patients, which means if you're, if you're the cup half full types, you can say, well, 71% of patients, three-fourths of my patients can do really well uh, with asthma treatment if I do a good job and they do a good job. Uh, but if you're the half uh, empty type of person, you can say, well, one fourth of my patients, no matter what I do, are not going to do well. Uh, and we really need to focus on those patients to find out what the problem is. My point is that asthma has fluctuating control, as you can see from this slide. And this slide is actually Children's Mercy data. And it's one of Dr. Portnoy's slides that he put up way back when, just to show how asthma goes up and down. Uh, and you can see the utilization scores in their different seasons. So there are different seasonal worsenings. There are uh, other reasons, social, economic, um, just the state of asthma, allergy triggers that cause these changes. So we need to be aware that we need to monitor asthma periodically. Now, patients with asthma do have exacerbations in the home, in the office, in the park, when they're outside. And uh, Dr. Reddy uh, Mumsa, who I know you're all very familiar with and adore, uh, worked with me long back when she was a fellow, actually, uh, on the yellow zone, and we had uh, started exploring this concept way back when. Uh, but uh, extending it, uh, so yes, the patient's flaring up, what do they do? I mean, one solution is to say, call me when you're flaring up, but if you think of the number of patients we have, uh, they really all can't call up call us when they're flaring up, and it, uh, that's all we would be doing then is telling them what to do when they flare up. So we really need to empower them to take care of the asthma, and we need to have a partnership uh, between them and us to understand their uh, sensitivity to their symptoms, what ac symptoms actually trigger asthma uh, and triggers trigger asthma in them, and how can we help them manage. And it's not just me saying it. Uh, we uh, There are studies done on this. For instance, the study by Partridge, uh, in um, the Primary Care Respiratory Journal uh, studied uh, asthma patients in different countries and the majority of patients stated that they didn't like uh, the uncertainty of having an asthma exacerbation 
but they all felt that they were pretty good about managing their asthma and the typical response was to step up their medication. So when patients themselves instinctively step up medications, when patients like to be in control of their fluctuating asthma control, we should give it to them. We should be able to give them strategies. Now, uh, way back when, again, when I was in uh, Children's Mercy, we used to give asthma action cards that Dr. Portnoy had patented, just a very beautiful set of asthma cards that we used to write out and give the patients. And uh, at that time, I was curious to know if patients really helped those, uh, felt that the asthma action plans and cards helped. So I did a survey, an anonymous survey, and found very uh, illuminatingly that nine out of 10 caretakers said it was a value in managing exacerbation. So even if you think that patients don't look at some of the plans we give them, I think when they're in need, they too try to dig it out and see if it can help them, or uh, they go to the emergency room, which we don't really want. So the yellow zone is the caution zone, where you're det detecting deterioration and you want to intervene, and the red zone is when it's quite uh, bad, you need to do something acutely. So this led to the development of the uh, acute loss of asthma control in the yellow zone, a practice parameter. And the reason we came up with this was, this was between uh, uh, the guidelines, uh, meaning after the guidelines came out, uh, there was a gap before the next guidelines uh, would have been uh, initiated. And uh, we felt there was emerging data that needed to be addressed. And uh, Dr. Portnoy actually was a huge supporter he was the co-chair of the task force at that time, and he encouraged me to go ahead and gather a group and work on this practice parameter. So a lot of the thoughts analysis that are presented now are based on this esteemed group looking at it. And I will tell you, it took a lot of um, discussion between the different group members to come up with some of these. Uh, so they're really a very thoughtful appraisal of the data. Now there. Some of the data is a direct yellow zone, a direct yellow zone studies, and some are not. I would say most of them are not, just because it's very hard to do a yellow zone study. By that I mean it's very hard to have a large cohort of patients who are just sort of you've captured and are just waiting, and then when they have an exacerbation or having symptoms at home, they call you and you're able to follow them up and you're able to see what happens. It's usually that patients who come to your attention are the ones who are in the ER or in the hospital. So these kinds of studies are hard, uh, but some have been done, and I'll show you some of the data, and I'll show you some extrapolated data. So this um, was actually um, uh, appreciated by many groups to have uh, a plan like this. So reverting to the EPR3 guidelines, this is what the guidelines had said, that in the yellow zone, um, the treatment uh, strategy is to respond by stepping up your short-acting beta agonists. And the document says that just two to six puffs of albuterol every three to four hours for 24 to 48 hours. And the majority of the country follows this because it's in the guidelines. And if the control is not regained, oral or systemic steroids may be required. So really, the strategy outlined in the most recent iteration of the guidelines was step up your SABA, and if not working, go to oral steroids which to a lot of us did not make sense because that's not really a strategy. That's what patients are doing. Use more rescue and then take steroids. We felt was not really the best kind of option to give for many reasons. One, it obviates the concept of yellow zone. So what is yellow zone? Go from green zone to red zone. That's really what we were saying. And as I just showed you in the Partridge study, patients spontaneously step up their medications themselves. So why should we not help them do that by giving them some sensible options? And oral steroid burst, as you know, is just not cough syrup, even though people think, oh, I just took five days of medicines and got better. That can't, be, can't do that much harm. We know that if you keep prescribing oral steroids in the long term, the cumulative dose is going to be harmful, and especially to the pediatric population. But I would say to the adult population, too, they, are on so many, they have so many other comorbidities that we really need to be careful about this frequent steroid burst. And... Um, we also know that there is in, uh, recent data that in viral triggered exacerbations, they don't uh, necessarily work that well. Uh, and uh, so uh, why would you give a strong medicine in a condition that doesn't actually respond to it? Uh, so the question came up, uh, can actually we do something? Can we prevent asthma exacerbations if we intervene? In other words, uh, if you look at the graph, which is um, green uh, here, uh, can we, when a patient's having an exacerbation, go in the red zone, move the graph so that it comes to the green and becomes steady state? 
so the best way to look at that is to actually look at the chronobiology of an asthma exacerbation. And while there is no such study saying, let me look at what happened during asthma exacerbation, there have been studies that while uh, exploring another concept, for instance, the Tattersfield study was looking at the different doses of budesonide to control asthma. Uh, budesonide and budesonide for Marol. So that was the main purpose of the study, but uh, during that exploration, they came up with some really fascinating and um, interesting data. And uh, the data is here in the graph that you can see. They looked at peak flow uh, in the morning and evening and asthma score at night and day. And you can see these fantastic graphs that show you that asthma control is relatively steady and then around day minus five-ish or minus seven it starts dipping and the dip is steep it's like boom it goes down and then it comes up uh, again around day five or so it starts uh, plus five it starts steadying and you gain control when I say steep I mean this part of the curve of course you can see here it's a little bit of a gentler slope and um, this same drop in AM peak flow is mirrored in the PM peak flow and is the opposite um, image of asthma nocturnal symptoms in daytime symptoms. So it's clear that there is a consistent pattern of worsening of asthma with a gradual um, slippery slope. That is what we hope to intervene in the yellow zone and then a rapid drop that ends up in the red zone. And the point is if we could arrest this gradual slope and make it more blunt and then go on, we might be able to do something good for these exacerbations. And that's the concept of the yellow zone, where there are many triggers, allergic, infectious, non-allergic irritants, leading to loss of control. And if we did have good yellow zone strategies, then maybe we'll prevent uh, worsening to the red zone. So the yellow zone is defined as a zone of acute or short-term loss of asthma control outside of the medical setting, so the home or park or wherever. And the goal, of course, is to regain control and prevent deterioration of the red zone, which means steroids to us, uh, systemic steroids, and increased utilization. So we looked at different studies uh, regarding the yellow zone. And as you may be aware, in the practice parameters, you have the grade analysis. You have to look at the rigorous studies, the randomized control trials, and then the large studies and go on that way. And then you come up with recommendations, strong recommendation, recommendation or no recommendation, uh, uh, depending on the strength of the study and how we interpret the data. So based on that, we looked at different yellow zone studies and concluded that these criteria uh, were actually very helpful uh, in picking up uh, acute asthma deterioration and that we should be instructing our patients to do this. So one is an increase in symptoms. Now what's an increase? If you normally have symptoms twice a day, then it'll be maybe about two times more than that. And the reason we say that is that's how some of the studies were based. If you have zero symptoms in a day, then having symptoms more than twice will put you in the yellow zone. Increase in use of reliever medications. Uh, so that would be one symptom. Again, the same concept of what's increased would depend on what's your baseline. And or if your symptoms don't improve, a come back less than four hours after treatment with SABA. So you've treated one time, you're in the soccer field, you have wheezing, you uh, take the albuterol, and then you come back home, and then you need it again uh, four hours later, and you're not feeling good. So that might mean yellow zone. The presence or increase in nocturnal symptoms. So you never have, you know, you slept well at night, and now you're waking up. So that might be an issue, especially if you're waking up because of breathing symptoms. And if you're the type who did peak flow, and the peak flow is there in many of the studies because many of them were adult studies and it was an objective criteria they could use. I know not everyone does peak flow and it's not necessary to do peak flow. You do not need peak flow for yellow zone criteria. But if you have patients who do, then these are the criteria declined to more than 15% or less than 80% of person the best. Now in children, we know that viral respiratory tract infection is often a trigger. And the problem we've found with our patients is that they start their asthma medication escalation only after they start wheezing, which, as I showed you from the graph, is the steep part of the graph. There's no point starting your medication at the steep part because you're already almost in red zone or close to it. So you really need to start at the slope, which is the onset of the respiratory tract infection as it's beginning to impact your airways. And uh, this criteria were called a strong recommendation with grade B evidence to support it. 
Now, just to give you an example of the, some of the studies and the graphs we used to try and analyze and sift through the data, so this is a Fitzgerald study that looked at nocturnal exacerbations. Now, again, it's looking at other concepts like budesonide and placebo, but this was actually a yellow zone study, and you can see how, again, as I showed you the um, around the minus 5 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7 time, you can see that there's a clear peak in symptoms. And so if the patient were able to pick up here, uh, while the symptoms were just starting, instead of waiting for this, uh, you know, we, it could have been improved. The first strategy the guidelines had was a short-acting beta agonist use that I showed you, and really that was the main strategy. Uh, after we reviewed the data, we decided that scheduled use was not recommended for a very simple reason. It did not prevent progression. So it symptomatically improves your uh, obstruction, but it does not really prevent you from going down that slippery slope. As you can see, many of the patients were in the placebo group where uh, albuterol was allowed and they did deteriorate. So uh, we recommended that, uh, based on C evidence, that patients use their saw buffer reliever using the yellow zone uh, at the dose of two to four puffs via MDI or nebulizer treatment every four to six hours, and I'm sorry I left out a word, as needed in addition to the escalated yellow zone. So we don't recommend scheduled use, only as needed use. And then we came up with certain cutoff uh, numbers. So the use exceeds 12 puffs per day or uh, eight puffs for kids. Um, then the patient should contact the provider for the guidance because uh, at that point we felt that they were overusing their short-acting beta agonist to the point where they may need further um, advice such as controllers or other things and they need to contact us. So the first recommendation is don't put patients on round-the-clock short-acting beta agonist alone. Uh, you need to combine it with something else and we prefer uh, as needed use rather than uh, a scheduled use because it doesn't really change the outcome. Um, so uh, if you uh, ask the question, how do I put this into my action plan, you guys are familiar with this because this is part of the plan that you have. The criteria are added here, and then there's a triage zone, uh, which says use two to four puffs of quick reliever uh, inhaler, repeated every 20 minutes to three, uh, three times, which is why we came up with the numbers of 12 and 8. Uh, based on this concept of if patients use this, what happens, but also because those numbers were used in some of the studies. So the next big question is, okay, I'm uh, giving you an argument about when to start yellow zone, but what about the duration of yellow zone? Again, I will refer you to another study called the PACT trial by COVAR, which was a, not a yellow zone study. It was actually to look at Montelukast, fluticasone, and a combination of uh, fluticasone and fluticasone salmeterol, and so it was not really related to a yellow zone study. But if you look at the chronobiology, again, you're seeing a similar pattern. This tells you it is consistent, it is real. This is the pattern patients experience. And as I showed you with the data of the minus 5 or 7 to plus 5 or 7, it takes about two weeks for your lung function to go back to normal. So we therefore recommended that two weeks is a good time for the yellow zone uh, duration of treatment. Of course, further research is needed, particularly just studying parameters uh, in the yellow zone um, exacerbation. But based on extrapolation of data and what I showed you earlier, this really made, seemed to make sense. Dr. Lemansky and uh, uh, Jackson came up with this really neat concept in 2011, which talked about asthma control. The long-term asthma control, which is more what we're used to in the NIH guidelines, which is increase in therapy for asthma, I won't talk about because the uh, uh, EPR3 talks about it very well. But I would like to focus your attention on the step-up short-term and the step-up intermittent. The step-up short-term really relates to a brief loss of control, like you went to grandma's house, the patient went to grandma's house and grandma has a cat. Uh, and the child wheezed, what do you do then? Or if you have a URI. So this is where we call it short-term step up. And then there's an intermittent step up where uh, you're playing soccer and you have symptoms and then you come home. So you use your B-roll as needed, but could you do something better than that? And does that predicate that you're going to have um, 
worse asthma later on. So based on that, uh, do these different uh, types of loss of control, uh, the main presumption or the, and the concept emphasized in the practice parameter is that each yellow zone episode uh, may be a little bit different and may require a different amount of supplemental anti-inflammatory medication, namely inhaled steroid to prevent progression. And the focus is going to be on the use of inhaled steroid, but other options are also going to be discussed which have evidence to support them. So the three different intervention strategies I'm going to talk about is one is a scheduled dosing where you know this is going to happen. You have an anticipated uh, loss of control. You would increase the total inhaled steroid dose at that time, um, typically quadrupling. And then comes the dynamic dosing where you use uh, inhaled steroids with reliever, and I'll discuss that. And then the adjustable maintenance dosing where, again, you use that uh, inhaled steroid but plus a, a quick acting uh, a quick onset long-acting beta agonist ICS for moderate therapy that's called adjustable maintenance dosing. I'm going to mention that to you though I do want to caution it's not approved in, for use in the United States uh, by the FDA. Um, there is a black box warning so we have to be careful about that approach but I'm going to show you the data. Okay, coming to the first concept of stepping up inhaled steroid dose. Uh, we, this um, summary statement says, advise patients who are on low to moderate dose daily ICS to increase the total dose for 24 hours. And we say example quadrupling because the most robust data is, deals with quadrupling or higher doses. Uh, we call this an option. Uh, but we call it B evidence um, because even though there are some randomized controlled trials I'm going to show you, there were a couple of um, missing details in the trials that didn't make it quite a grade A. Um, the way to increase the dose could be by increasing frequency. Uh, if you wanted to do, for instance, two puffs four times a day, that actually would be better pharmacodynamically uh, than increasing the puffs, making four puffs twice a day, uh, but both are good. In escalating is really the point. Um, so doubling doses were used by us uh, for a long time uh, and um, the NIH uh, EPR3 looked at the data and reviewed it and said because of recent studies doubling doses were not recommended. When we looked at the studies we did notice they had weaknesses in the design like some of the patients were starting late in the therapy. As I said, if they already start after they're in the steep part of the slope, they're not going to work. It was not studied in those not on inhaled steroids. So if you notice these studies I'm going to present to you, patients are already on ICS. So what about the steroid naive patients? What about the intermittent asthma patients? Uh, what about high dose use there? And in our patient data, and at Children's Mercy, I was there for 17 years, I felt, and the patients used to report to me that the yellow zone strategy worked. They would tell me, oh, three, you know, three times this worked, and then once I had to end up taking steroids um, because I didn't start it soon enough or something like that. So um, while, but uh, officially the uh, uh, doubling doses are not recommended because we didn't have data that supported it in recent studies, though there's older studies that supported that. So the main two studies about the quadrupling, one is a Foresti study, which actually is alluded to in the EPR3, uh, which looked at quadrupling doses. This study uh, looked at uh, budesonide dose of 400 micrograms twice a day uh, 100 and 100 uh, micrograms dose twice daily. So it really was a comparative study of budesonide dose to control asthma, so comparing 400 micrograms versus 100 micrograms twice daily. They also threw in this third arm, which I thought was a brilliant idea, and it's very helpful for yellow zone um, studies, is 100 micrograms twice daily. So a low dose budesonide and then quadrupling the dose. And they defined the primary outcome by a fall in peak flow less than 70% from baseline, calculated in the last two weeks pretreatment on at least two days. So you have to have dropped your peak flow for two days of symptoms. And the data showed that in patients in group two, which is the yellow zone group you're talking about, who had a quadrupling of the ICS at the onset of exacerbation had significantly better outcomes. And these are what we are calling significantly better outcomes. So look at the number of exacerbations. Um, there were no exacerbations. So group one, and so group one is a high dose um, uh, budesonide. Group two is the quadrupling dose. See the similar in, the, in having 83% no, of them had no exacerbation, so 80% plus, which is great compared to 68%. And one exacerbation was around 10%. Um, so they really were pretty compelling data that it markedly cut down the number of exacerbations. So compare that to the 22.7 on the other side. And similar with the number of days of exacerbations, it cut short 
how long the exacerbations lasted very dramatically. So it was fantastic data. However, this is not a yellow zone primary study, as I told you, which is why the level of evidence had to come down a little bit because it was not designed as a pure yellow zone study. Now, this was designed as a pure yellow zone study, and this was done by Osborne in 2009, uh, a randomized controlled trial of uh, uh, children and adults more than 16 years who were already on beclomethazone or equivalent ICS, and they had a large group, 403 subjects. The criteria here was asthma deteriorating or URI, peak flow, again, you notice it's two consecutive days, or 30% on day one from mean run in AMP uh, peak flow. And the intervention was a usual asthma treatment plus placebo, meaning do whatever you normally do, a quadruple ICS use with peak flow decline. And they looked at the oral steroid requiring exacerbations. So if you looked at the primary outcome, which is the um, uh, number randomized in the number requiring oral steroids, there actually wasn't much difference, uh, mainly because they found that a large number of patients were not adhering to study protocol. Uh, which is a sad uh, thing uh, to happen in a research study, but it's really true of a real life. What happens to our patients, they don't remember it started in inhalers, which is a big problem with yellow zone uh, treatment, because if you don't start it, it's not going to work. But in patients adhering to the study protocol, you can see a dramatic drop in the uh, or uh, exacerbation requiring oral steroids. So 20% active versus 50% placebo required oral steroids. It's a relative risk reduction of 57%, which is fantastic. There are not many uh, treatment strategies in asthma that can cause a 50% uh, uh, reduction in exacerbation. So that's really excellent study, but because the primary outcome was negative in the sense of uh, in the total group, they couldn't show a change. This was called a study B, category B. What about uh, preschoolers who are wheezing? Uh, we came up with a summary statement that in children less than six years of age with recurrent wheezing and risk factors for asthma, that is in those who had a positive modified asthma predictive index. And I know all of you at Children's Mercy use this uh, modified asthma predictive index. In those patients alone, consider initiating high-dose ICS or oral montelukast to reduce intensity of symptoms. So you're not going to really succeed in decreasing exacerbations too much because uh, it's very hard to control uh, wheezing infants, except if you go to very high doses, as in the Dusharmi study, who did show a significant change, but the inhaled steroid dose was very high, and people are worried about long-term side effects um, and growth, especially. Uh, in the other studies by Zyger and uh, Beccaria, Montelukast helped in the Beccaria study and in the Zyger study, um, there was an improvement in symptoms. So that's why we called it an option with B evidence. So an example of this is the Beccaria study, which compared Montelukast, high-dose budesonide, uh, one milligram twice a day, and conventional therapy. And you can see that there wasn't a striking difference in the exacerbation rate, but there was improvement in symptoms. Uh, which which helps. So uh, that's why we call it an option. But a recent meta-analysis actually in 2016 that came out in pediatrics show, looked at the evidence of daily inhaled steroids, uh, intermittent inhaled steroids and montelukast in preventing severe exacerbations among preschool children with recurrent wheeze. And they looked at 22 studies um, and uh, looked at these different um, comparisons and found um, that in preschool children, and they had the primary outcome was what happens when you use it daily, but they also looked at preschool children with intermittent asthma or viral triggered wheezing, and they found strong evidence to support intermittent ICS for preventing exacerbations. Uh, they found a 35% risk uh, reduction. Now, that's not as robust as a 50 or 57%, but that's not bad considering the other option is they end up on oral steroids. So in the, or, or worse, systemic, um, you know, uh, intramuscular, intravenous. So in these studies, children generally received high-dose ICS starting at the first sign of a URI for 7 to 10 days, which is really the strategy we're talking about. But I just want you to be more aware of the data in the younger age group uh, that is not quite as robust. So there is some risk reduction, there is some symptom improvement, but it's not uh, guaranteed. The second strategy is the dynamic dosing, and we can come to that. So dynamic dosing is symptom-driven use of controller with reliever therapy, which means, in other words, every time you're using 
uh, Saba to improve your symptoms, you're piggybacking a reliever, and this reliever we're going to talk about would be an ICS. So in this model, patients with asthma of mild severity receive greater or lesser amounts of ICS in proportion to asthma control. I do want to stress that in this model, we're only talking about asthma of mild severity. So we're not talking about the moderate or severe person asthmatics. We're just talking about the intermittent or mild asthmatics uh, who you can piggyback the ICS. And that's because that's how the study was done. So for patients with mild and moderate asthma, consider recommending symptom-driven use of ICS uh, along with the beta agonist when they have a yellow zone. So this was based on a few really elegant studies. One was by Pappy in 2007, which came in the New England Journal of Medicine where they compared rescue use of beclomethasone and albuterol in a single inhaler for mild asthma. Now, we don't have the luxury of having albuterol and beclomethasone in a single inhaler, though I'm hearing some little rumors from um, that there might be something coming out in the near future, which would be fantastic. But uh, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, just because I got something which said my internet might be a problem. But, um, so when you look at this, um, you can see they, they looked at four groups, as needed combination therapy, just beclomethasone, beclomethasone with albuterol in a single inhaler, which is called the combination therapy, uh, which was they used as needed or daily, and then as needed albuterol. And you can see that as needed ICS in the adults, which is this combination therapy, was equivalent here to regular beclomethasone therapy. So, aha, our patients are right. You know you know how they, they just take the medicine when they're flaring up. And in some of them, that strategy seems to work, as well as being on daily ICS. And that's what the PAPI study showed. At that point, it was very revolutionary because we had um, kind of disciplined ourselves to tell our patients to do daily ICS no matter what. And then here comes the study which says, you know what? The, what our patients do with the intermittent ICS, piggybacking on um, short-acting beta agonist, does work for some of them. So it was very exciting to us to hear that data. And this was followed up by Martinez in a, another brilliant study in Lancet in 2011 that looked at children. And they had a cohort of 288 uh, children between 5 to 18 years. Similar concept again, baclomethasone with placebo. The only difference is they didn't have the luxury of a single inhaler which, as you know, always complicates things a little bit. Uh, but same kind of strategies were used. And uh, they found similar results, which was fantastic. The time to exacerbation requiring oral steroids was very similar in the daily ICS group, the combined group, and the rescue ICS group. But even better was that they found, uh, as we might expect, that the rescue ICS group, that is a group that's piggybacking ICS to Saba use, had a um, no change in their uh, height. So they were similar to placebo in how they behaved, whereas a combined ICS group showed a loss of 1.1 centimeters. Now I know we all think um, a little bit of loss of height is no big deal. It's more important to breathe than how tall you are. Uh, but um, having said that, we are always very cognizant of our Hippocratic Oath, which is above all, do no harm. And therefore, whatever strategy we do, if it can have benefits along with in terms of improving efficacy, but also minimizing side effects, that of course would be the better option. So um, that's a dynamic dosing strategy, um, it, but can be used only for the mild asthmatics, not really for the uh, everybody. The next strategy is called the adjustable maintenance dosing, which actually has the most robust data and is very popular in Canada and Europe and is part of the guidelines. Here, uh, you use combination therapy, ICS with quick onset long-acting LABA, uh, in tandem as a maintenance and a reliever, so which means you use it daily for twice a day, whatever your doctor has prescribed, and then when you're having symptoms, you step it up and use the same inhaler again, um, for rescue as well as for controller. And as you can intuitively see, that is really helpful for our patients. Just to have one inhaler, use it more often when you're sick and use it less often when you're not that sick. Sounds like a great idea. Um, because it, and if it, on top of that, it helps establish anti-inflammatory therapy and give symptom relief, then couldn't be better. So that's the concept of the uh, maintenance and reliever uh, use, also called SMART uh, therapy. And um, 
just to give you an idea of the robustness of the data there, um, th this is a um, study in the annals that compared different strategies. And you can see the different types of studies, STEAM, STEP, STAY, SMILE, COMPASS, AHEAD. It doesn't matter what the study was called. Focus on the red color bar. The red bar is budesonide for moderol. And all these studies really were done on budesonide. Uh, I know there's more medicine for moderol, but they really weren't studied using that strategy. Um, so for moderol is the key here because it is the larva that's short acting, immediate onset. Now there are other ones uh, available now, but these studies were done on that. So whatever strategy you compared it to, whether it was the gold with the budesonide and short acting beta agonist, or the purple with budesonide um, for moderol and SABA, or the blue, it, did, it showed that the maintenance and reliever concept really uh, had the best outcomes in terms of asthma exacerbations. It's confusing how it works. We're not exactly sure. We think there are genomic and non-genomic responses. Regardless, we know in our battle of adherence with our patients, it's really sweet to create a win-win situation. And it is a standard of care in many countries in Europe and Canada. But I do want you to know this. There's no FDA approval for AMD in the United States for many reasons. There is the black box warning on the LABA component. The tribuhillar device in these studies is not available for use. And the studies used high doses of, so they went up to three times approved FDA dose. And there's also concerns with our patient population that maybe a symptom-driven approach may not be feasible if they don't perceive their dyspnea. You know, they could be overusing this medicine and thinking that they're getting better when they're not. And, um, you know, issues like that, of course, concern us that patients may not be able to pick up their stuff. The Cochrane review uh, of the safety of uh, the adjustable maintenance dosing strategy looked at 20 randomized controlled trials with over 10,000 adults um, and found uh, significantly fewer asthma-related SAEs, which was always a concern for us, and no difference in all-cause SAEs. But in children, they just didn't have enough number of events to draw con meaningful conclusions. So overall, in adults, they didn't really find any signal of concern and in kids, they didn't have enough data. There was another Cochrane review that actually looked at AMD approach uh, to reduce exacerbations against current best practice strategies and fixed higher dose of ICS, which you know is was a stable therapy. And they found more discontinuations due to adverse effects on the AMD strategy, but there were no significant differences in the adverse events. However, they again cautioned against using it in adolescents and children less than 18, not because it was necessarily a bad thing, but just because they didn't have enough data to be comfortable to say that. So that's what we had in our practice parameters, and I want to bolster this uh, information with newer data from GINA, or I would just say newer recommendations from GINA. And as I told you, they update their um, some of their strategies every year. So this is the 2017. And uh, this really nice document called A Roadmap to Asthma Control will help you understand some of that. They defined a flare-up as an acute or subacute worsening of symptoms in lung function compared to the patient's normal. Flare-up is a term they preferred for talking to patients. They felt exacerbation was not something that patients could understand. An attack is kind of nonspecific. An episode um, seems to downplay the importance of the event. Um, and they state that use a written asthma action plan, um, and they have given strategies for management in primary care ED and follow-up of the exacerbation. But they say that all patients should have a plan how to recognize and respond to worsening asthma, should be individualized for the patient's medications, level of control and health literacy, and based on, on symptoms for children and peak flow if you have that. It should include the patient's asthma medications, when and how to increase reliever and controller, how to access medical care, but why? The main reason was it helped reduce asthma morbidity and mortality. So this is the kind of graph, the um, uh, schematic they uh, are presenting to us. So all patients should um, have self-monitoring symptoms, written plan, medical review, and they say in the early or mild uh, flare-up, increase the reliever, early increase in controller and review response. And of course, if you get worse, you're in the red zone. So the reliever, increase frequency as needed, adding space for PMDI. And the increase they're suggesting is up to a maximum ICS of 2,000 micrograms budesonide or equivalent. And they're, they're, I'll show you some graphs about what they call the controllers. Add oral steroids if needed. 
Um, and the rationale for this is that uh, is really they are reiterating a little bit of what we said in our practice parameters that their most exacerbations have increased inflammation, so it makes sense to add an anti-inflammatory agent. Most evidence was involving double doubling doses, uh, but they found that there was a little bit of weakness there, and there was a lack of generalizability of placebo-controlled trials. So they are recommending quadruple dose of ICS, quadruple dose of budesonide for monoral or early small increase in ICS for monoral, which is really the strategies we talked about. So this table would be important for you as a summary, which is from the GINA, about our strategies and what they think about it. But if you notice in this, they also talk about at least double ICS. So at least when you include the double ICS or greater, but the other strategies are really what we already discussed. Here are some doses for what is called low, medium, and high dose ICS, and this is more a table of clinical comparability. And I just bring this up more for your reference to use when you are um, stepping up. And similarly, this is for 6 to 11 years of age. So how do we actually use this in our practice? And I know this is a little bit of when you start scratching your head because you are saying, you probably tell me you're saying in quadruple ICS and how do I do that? Do I prescribe the same inhaler and step it up and the patient runs out of it? Do I prescribe different inhalers? Do I prescribe inhalers of two strengths? I think it would depend on your insurance company. And as I've lectured to different allergists across the country, I think uh, everyone's come up with their own local homegrown strategy that works for them. So these are some options you can, the point is to step up the medication. Some um, pre allergists prescribe, prefer to give uh, a low dose inhaler for main maintenance, like a fluticasone 44 micrograms, for instance. And then when the patient is ex for the yellow zone, they prescribe a separate inhaler, fluticasone 220 micrograms, and say use this for the yellow zone. It's still the same two puffs. Uh, but it's a stronger inhaler and insurance doesn't seem to have a problem with that in some places. However, you can argue that the patient will get confused with the same color. How do you make it different? And those are good questions. To avoid that, some people prescribe different inhalers and use that strategy. Um, and it becomes even more complicated if they are on uh, ICS uh, LABA combinations that do not have a short-acting agent in it. Then how do you, if you can, how do you, that, do, that has a short acting agent, and how do you step it up? Uh, you have to probably add the ICS separately, but adds to inhaler confusion. And those are good points to discuss. I'll summarize, and then we can chat about these things, um, that the changes to consider in your practice are definitely prescribe asthma action plans with instructions on daily medication use. Um, using the green, yellow, red zone. And the green zone, I would stress, is for daily medication. And the most single effective thing you can do to cut exact, short exacerbations is to have a good green zone controller plan. For sure, if you prescribed uh, regular medication that is effective, you will be able to help the patient significantly. Having said that, there are patients who do worsen on a daily basis or a regular basis. And for that, we need a yellow zone plan. Uh, and uh, which should provide instructions and step up of therapy. Make sure you are titrating the plan to the patient's literacy level and understanding level and use a pictorial asthma plan or whatever else you want to help them or label the inhalers or any strategies you can do to help them understand this would be great. Prescribe instructions on using repetitive doses of short-acting beta agonists uh, and set limits. Tell them don't use more than 12 puffs or 8 puffs depending on their um, age and other, um, you know, your understanding of their background uh, severity of their asthma and their uh, response pattern. Uh, and prescribe quadrupling or higher doses of ICS as a step-up therapy option uh, that does have evidence to support it. Uh, again, doubling doses um, has some evidence anecdotally and otherwise, and um, that would be something to consider in an individual patient, especially if you know it works, but the data overall suggests supporting quadrupling or higher doses. But stepping up, piggybacking ICS to symptom-based bronchodilator use, which may be similar in concept to the doubling doses in our mild patients or just adding smaller doses of ICS. But the point is to add the ICS when they have the SABA. So you just tell them every time you use your red inhaler, use your orange inhaler or whatever color inhaler with it might be a good idea. And uh, always, always tailor strategies to the patient per their preference and response. Nothing's going to work if they don't take it. 
Uh, so you have to figure out how to make it work for them. And uh, we also, the understanding should be that there is not one strategy that works for uh, every patient and not one strategy that works for that patient consistently. So you may need to have separate strategies. Uh, and if it didn't work, then consider switching. It's not set in stone that only one therapy or strategy works. The bottom line, if there's one message I want you to take home, that is a false start, meaning starting early. Even if the patient did not end up in the yellow zone and did great, it's fine. You is much preferred over a late start because that means oral steroids and utilization. I'm sorry, systemic steroids and utilization, and we don't want that. So prompt recognition and initiation and control your yellow zone strategy for two weeks. Don't stop it early, otherwise you'll get a rebound or they'll deteriorate. That's also not a good idea. Um, so I would like to acknowledge um, some leaders who have been very inspirational and instrumental in getting this practice parameter together. The main core group was Dr. Pornoy, Dr. Oppenheimer, Bacarrier, um, Dr. Lee and Carolyn Kulksmar, um, and then the members of the Practice Parameter Task Force uh, oversaw our document and had many, many interesting comments and thoughts to share. The Academy and the College reviewed it. They had reviewers. We also consulted with Dr. Bussey and Dr. Lemansky, who were super helpful. And uh, the other reviewers were Dr. Fogg, Zeffler, Rafi, Krejcilevsky, Schatz, Olaf, Michael Blaze, and then people from outside when we posted public comments also sent in their comments, which is very helpful, like Christine Wagner and Ann Borgmeyer. So with that, um, I thank everyone for um, listening to me, and uh, hopefully this has made you think about how we can better partner with our patients and what we can do to improve care. Um, what do I do now? End this show? Okay. Sure. Um, does anybody in the audience here, either online or here in the, the conference room, have any questions for Dr. Dikar? Chitra, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> We're looking at your uh, necktie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. But move your, yeah, move your camera up a little bit. Oh, you want to see my face. There we go. There we go. Now we can see it. Okay. Um, um, I you was know why you were looking at my, you were looking at my necktie because Paul, I figured out how to connect my laptop to my big TV screen. So I was actually looking at my TV screen uh, projection. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go okay. ahead. Um, no, I was just curious from your own experience. Um, um, <clears throat> uh, there's a couple areas that I guess I've, I've have always been concerned about with dynamic dosing is that the long-acting uh, or the the combination medicines that have formoterol are approved for 12 and above, you know, if you're using it by FDA approval. Um, and the other thing, as you said, they're approved to be used twice a day, not four times a day or whatever. Um, but the, I guess for, um, for um, um, teenagers, um, um, even if they can be on those medicines and you use that dynamic dosing, um, it, do you have a gestalt or, or not um, regarding um, which of the kind of um, yellow zone um, uh, uh, programs that you've um, had more success with teenagers? Is it is it easier to get a teenager to, because they, they often will use albuterol if they need it, is it easier to just convince them to use their, their controller medicine, which they're probably not using on a regular basis? Uh, or as consistently as they should, use that with the albuterol and just do those as needed, um, you know, during your exacerbation? Or um, do you think um, you've had more luck with just having them, you know, double or quadruple the dose um, um, or the dynamic dosing with, the, with a, you know, a, a combination medicine? Uh, to be honest, Paul, um, and that's a, a fantastic question because teenagers are obviously very, um, a little bit more challenging in terms of their um, responsiveness to picking up their symptoms as well as stepping up therapies. Uh, the best data overall consistently every single time is the adjustable maintenance therapy data. And actually, Canada allows 12 and over to use that strategy. Uh, they have it, and I uh, they have it on their website as a strategy that they could use. Um, 
and uh, their cutoff is not to exceed 72 micrograms of form water per day. And I'm seeing that number again. And if you look at the GINA table I showed you, they've also stressed that, uh, that they all, almost even rank that strategy above every other strategy um, in terms of uh, use. So if at some point we get um, clearance from the FDA to use that, that would definitely be the most effective strategy for our patients, for all patients. Use one combination product and then step it up would be what, and especially for teenagers, that would be great. Having said that, I personally haven't used it uh, because of the other concerns about uh, teenagers not being perceiving their symptoms that well and, uh, uh, you know, maybe being deniers of their symptoms, stuff like that, and are they overusing it? Um, but I think if you have teenagers who uh, and, and parents who are able to understand it, that would be a great strategy. So I would love to use that if I could. Not being able to use that, I do use whatever uh, stepping up in health steroid strategy that works at that situation for them and with their. Uh, I like the idea of prescribing an inhaler, a strong inhaler because I really don't think people like to use too many puffs at a time and therefore using like a fluticasone 220 with a two puffs option is a better uh, way for them to accept it. And even if all they did was just switch the use to that inhaler and didn't even have to add on separately, so at least they have just say use just use this inhaler instead and just use it as often as you want would be the strategy I've used. I don't know yeah, if it helps. The only issue that I've had is that there are a lot of parents that will have trouble just affording um, their regular controller medicine, um, let alone, you know, getting a second in, um, inhaler, um, which um, my experience has been harder to get insurance companies to pay for two. They want you to, you know, use one or the other sort of thing. So I just haven't um, done it at the same time. So what I do is when they come for the first visit, I give one, and when they come for the next, I give the other prescription. So the insurance company doesn't really know it just takes it as a new prescription for an inhaler. Do they, because uh, uh, I mean, I um, not with an inhaler, but with, with one of my blood pressure medicines, they, my primary care doctor increased the dose, so I take a smaller dose in the morning and a larger dose at nighttime, but they're two mm -hmm. separate pills. And um, when I went to fill um, the smaller dose that I'd been on twice a day, they, they, um, um, didn't want to fill one of the scripts because they said, well, you have two scripts for the same medicine, one's five and one's ten. Um, so, um, and I had to go through this whole rigmarole to get them to approve it. But um, I guess a lot of it's going to depend on, yeah, as you said, the insurance and and the luck of the, the draw, I guess. Yeah, because Dr. Lemansky at Wisconsin told me that he does very often the fluticasone 44 type of, or whatever, baclomethazone low dose for green zone and does the separate inhaler higher dose for yellow and that strategy has worked very well for their group and they've worked with their insurance companies I guess to come to an understanding. So uh, it is a challenge, there's no question, uh, which is why I really favor the single inhaler step up concept. But till we get that, we'd have to, you know, I think work with the other issues. Okay. Well, um, we're going to end it here. Um, I appreciate you taking the time for your busy schedule to to join us this morning and give a great talk. Thanks very much for such a great talk and and have a great week. Thank you very Thank much. You.